I would have liked to. I would have liked to, have, you know, wrestled in Atlanta a little bit. I would have loved to have been on the in the new in the New York area because of the exposure you got there. Uh, but the kind of money we were making, we couldn't we couldn't make it anywhere else. You couldn't make it in Tennessee. You couldn't make that in Florida. You couldn't yeah. make it in North Carolina. I mean, those guys. It was a grind for those guys. Not that. They weren't doing well in North Carolina. They did really well. They they came in. The Crockets came in when they took over and actually watched our TV and saw how we did it, and and took that footprint back with them. They were doing fantastic, and the guys were making really good money. But they were working 366 days of the year and a lot of double shots. We were working 220 to 250, and making as much or more than they were. Yeah. You know, so uh, my father, the big thing was you had to have time for your family. And in the Midwest and, uh, you know, from Winnipeg to St. Louis to the West Coast in May, everybody was outdoors. They didn't, they didn't want to come into an arena. So we got six weeks off. We got all of May in the first two weeks in June. And then we had, you know, a few little, little shots in some of the smaller towns and the major cities would run every month. But we wouldn't we wouldn't draw really big, and I can give you a really good example of that. Hogan wrestled. Uh, we wrestled in April in Minneapolis or in St. Paul, and we sold out the civic or the uh, civic center at the time. Twenty two thousand people. The building next door. We had another eight in that close circuit. The match. It was him and Bachwinkle and I think Vernon Mad Dog uh, against Ventura and Adonis. I believe is what it was. Right. And um, it was a strong card. Well, Hogan came back and we took May off. He said, book May. He said, I'm red hot. We went from a, I think it was a $180,000 gate to a $30,000 gate. And that was Hogan in the main event. All right. And that was May. Proved to him when we told him, hey, we just don't run. You don't do it. We, we can't draw. Talk about why your father decided to team with other companies and create Pro Wrestling USA. And why do you feel? Well, it was all the promoters started calling. Right. You know, you know, Vince this and Vince that. Hey, we gotta, we all bind together, and then so Vern said, "Well, okay, well, we'll be in with that." But uh, you know, it was it was really the egos. Well, it was really hard because what you have to do is, like I told you, when we did our booking, somebody had the fi final say, and nobody trusted each other. Yeah, it was the funny thing. I mean, it was it was too bad. Uh, because I think it, it could have worked if you'd have just said, okay, so-and-so, you're going to run it. But which ego would have let run it? Crockett's wouldn't let you run it. They wanted to run their thing. You know, Crockett's, Jesus, we formed this deal. We got a big match in Comiskey Park, did a good house. They're in there th that night trying to sign all the AW guys to contracts, all the AWA guys to contracts. Jerry Black, come on with us. You know, I mean, you know. Yeah. What made you decide to retire? Because you did the what angle with him, actually. I mean, what, what? Too many injuries. I had a herniated disc in my lower back. I actually had a, a contract for I went to work for Turner to wrestle for him. And it was really a nice contract. It was the same thing that their top guys were getting at the time. And I was working out. What was the guy? Hurd. He Jim was Hurd. running. Jim yeah. Hurd wanted me down there. And um, I was working out real hard. I took, was going to do about six weeks and then make the move. And I got to where I couldn't bend over and tie my shoe. God damn it. No chiropractor couldn't. He says, Barry, you have an MRI. I had herniated my disc. And they said, you're done. You know, one slam, bad slam, bam, bump, you could end up in a wheelchair. Another big, powerful guy that worked with the company, he was an announcer for you guys, uh, did a lot of stuff behind the scenes, Eric Bischoff. What are your memories of uh, working with Eric during his days in AWA? Eric Bischoff. I could tell you some stories there. Eric uh, came to us. He was selling ninja suits out of the trunk of his car. And uh, uh, our last, one of our announcers, I forget who it was, was walked, uh, left us. I think it was Larry, because we just did an interview with uh, Eric and he was telling us that. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. So that's how Eric became the announcer. Then we worked with him and worked with him and worked with him and worked with him. And then um, when Jim Hurd wanted, he wanted, he. Jim Hurd, he was a character. He came up and met with us and wanted to expand. 
and he wanted to hire me. He didn't want to hire Vern. And so then he left and he called me up and he said, hey, Greg, I want you to do me a favor. I'll, uh, uh, I'll give you X amount of dollars to put our TV in your TV slot. I said, wait a minute, you're asking me to stab my father in the back? I said, are you out of your frickin' mind? I hung up on him. And then he had somebody else call me down there and I said, look at, uh, and Eric was, you know, we were, we, I could see the writing on the wall, we just weren't gonna make it. And Eric needed a job and I said, here, why don't you take Bischoff down there and use him as an announcer? That's how he got the job down there. Did you get along with him behind the scenes? Eric? Yeah. Then I did. Not anymore? Not when I worked for him with Turner, no. What, what happened between you two, if you don't mind me asking? Didn't he tell you? I don't remember. I actually don't. I'd signed a contract. I didn't sign it. I had a contract. Bill Watts hired me. It was X amount of dollars. And I said, Bill, I can't come for that. I'm making more than that here. I said, well, what I will do. I said, if I can come down there, he said, we're going to give Dusty a break. He's been here a long time, and we have maybe you and Mike Graham and, and somebody else start doing the booking for a little while, and then we'll bring Dusty back in. I said, okay, then here's what I want. I want um, X amount per rating we go up, and I want uh, a point for every, or uh, X amount of dollars for every point it goes up on the pay-per-views. I want to build in some incentives here. If we can't make it work, I don't get paid. Right. It's that simple. I said, that's why I've always worked. Incentives. That's why the wrestlers always worked, and that's why I want to work. Great. So I went down there, and uh, the first day in there, uh, he had J Jim Ross in there, and a couple of, I forget who else was in there at that time, Crockett, one of the Crockett's. And he said, what's wrong with our program? Why can't we compete with McMahon? I want you to tell everybody, you've told me. I said, well, here's what you need to do. Here's the steps you need to follow. And Jim, you've got to tone it down. If you're going national, people up in Minnesota don't like that southern twang and that screaming all the time. They just don't like it. And if you're going to go into the AWA area or you're going to go into New York, I don't think it's going to make it. That's one thing. Cameras. What you have to do to compete. I went through the whole thing, laid it all out for him. And I hadn't signed my contract yet. And Bill said, just hang on for another week before you sign it, okay? I want to go over a couple of things with you here. He said, you made some really good, that was really a strong presentation you made. I said, okay. So then at the end of the week, Bill is sitting, we're sitting talking, and he says, yeah, they got this, ex they want to make somebody an executive producer. And I said, well, maybe I should go down there and you know, talk to Bill Shaw about it. Uh, they got Bischoff in there and they got Tony Schiavone and they've got uh, uh, David Crockett and then uh, who was the big heavy guy that used to do his own thing in Atlanta TV? Joe know? Petticino? Joe Petticino. They're up for it. He said it's not that big of a deal. So we're on the road all week and we end up in, in uh, I forget where, somewhere in South Carolina and um, Bill was going to meet us there and we we'll signed the contract. He comes in and he says, well, I just got fired today. And Bischoff's your new boss. He's the executive producer. I went, oh, fuck. Right, you on the be wall. kidding me. Yeah. So um, I hadn't signed the contract. And then they had, and Dusty was out. Mike Graham and I were laying out probably nine TV shows we had to get done. And we're in the room working, and Eric comes walking in, hands his piece here, sign your contract. I said, Eric, we got all these TVs to get done tonight. I'm going to take it home with me and let my lawyer look at it. Right. No, here, sign it. No, he, he got out. He came back probably five, six times. And I said, has anything changed in this? No, nothing's changed. So we signed the thing. Stupid. I learned a lesson that way. So... The first pay-per-view comes up and, and the ratings come out and they've gone up. And, and I said, hey, Mike and I get our bonuses here. What do you mean your bonuses? That's in our contract. Well, there's nothing in there. He'd taken all the things we had and put it in his contract. 
So now we're, we're on the road and he, he wants me to ride back with him. And I, I, I said, Eric, I'm so pissed off at you. He said, what do I need to do to turn this thing around? And I said, you gotta get Hogan. That's the only way you can turn it around and compete with McMahon. I, he said, well, I don't know him. Can you get him? I said, I can contact him and I can get him. But first, I want a contract with you and Bill Shaw. I want a piece of, of Hogan. I want a piece of his merchandising. I want a piece of the ratings. I want all this, like it was in my other contract. You get me that in writing and I'll get it to you. So two days later, he calls me and I said, you got the deal? He said, I talked to Bill. They're getting it worked up, but Bill's going out of town Friday. Can you get to Hogan? I said, I've already contacted him. He'll sit down and listen, but I want that thing in writing before I'll set up the appointment with you. Somehow he got Hogan's number. The following Monday, I found out they signed him on Friday and never got my deal. And that was it. So, well, now I'm, I'm steamed. So I got a third thing, and I went and talked to Hogan. I said, Hulk, I got a deal for you. Uh, Turner, just a good friend of mine, Jack Kelly, he does the Goodwill Games for Turner Broadcasting. And he called me in, and I've been talking to him, and they lost their TV in Russia. I said, my father and I were going to train a guy named Alexander Karelin. He is the Greco-Roman champion, four gold medals. He's won in four different ones. And he wants to turn pro. Then we met him, and we're going to teach him how to work. Here's my idea. We have a pay-per-view. We'll build him up for a year here. A pay-per-view, you and him in Russia. We'll come back with one in the U.S. And we'll do a neutral site, the third one in Japan. I said, it'll kill McMahon. We'll kill him. He told Bischoff. So we do our taping down in Florida. I go home for the weekend. I get a call uh, Sunday night. I'm going to leave Monday for the taping or for whatever it was. And he said, hey, there's no need to come back. I said, what do you mean? You're done. Who called you? Bischoff. He said, you went behind my back. I said, well, after two times you know, kicked in the balls, why wouldn't I go behind your back? He said, well, you're done. I said, okay, I, I, this was on a weekend. And I said, okay, I'll see you Monday. So I flew back to Atlanta Monday. I went up, I was going to throw him out the window on the 14th floor. And he never showed up. So, so that's the story how that thing went down. And you haven't talked to Eric since at all then? I've talked to him a few times. I think we've kind of, we've brushed paths. I've talked to him a couple of times about his production company. I had something for him. But I said, what I want to do, I want to, before I present this, TV show I've got, I want to I want to come and sit with you and eyeball and talk face to face before we do that. Right. But we, we haven't done that. You know? Have you guys ever had a chance to really talk about it after uh, the fact over the years? Hawk? Yeah, you and Hawk. Well, I got him into Turner Broadcasting, no okay. matter what Ric Flair says. Um, I got I was the one that got him there. And uh, I never really we never really talked about it because there was no need to. Past is the past. Yeah. Okay. How did you end up getting the call from WCW? Was it Bill Watts Bill called, Watts called you? Yeah. Okay. What? Go ahead. I, I, Bill, when he wrestled for my father, I was only about twelve years old, but I used to they used to work out together, lift weights, and he'd get me on the weights, and I really became pretty close to Bill. And mm -hmm. and Bill, uh, he was having a tough time down in Atlanta. He wasn't getting his point across the way he thought it should go. And he learned a lot from my dad. In fact, when my dad passed away, he sent me a really a nice letter and maybe a, a phone call. And he knew the one thing that nobody down there could do was see the long range product and where it was going down the line. So my first week there, I, I laid out their whole year of pay-per-views for him. And he said, that's, that's, nobody could do that. They were so used to the weekly thing. They'd go from week to week to week. Nobody could see that long range where you wanted to go. And that's what my father taught me. So that's what I did the first week, laid out that whole year for him and, you know. What did you think of the product at the time when you first came into WCW? Well, they had, they had some, like I said, they had Steve Austin. They had Triple H. They had Kevin Nash. They had Booker T. They had some good talent, but they were all green yet. Right. But there was the potential there. You just had to bring them along. And, and I've said that to a lot of people over the years. You know, 
the one thing that my father taught me and what we was really good at was bringing young talent around and how to bring how to make them help them evolve into the stars and that's what very few people know how to do what were your main responsibilities working for WCW well it was booking writing the TV first with Dusty of course, when Dusty was late, they let him, gave him a month break, and then when he came back in, Mike and I were with Dusty, and they brought in Fuller and, and uh, Bill Dundee, so the five of us, but we had a, a lot of TV we had to lay out all the time. Uh, I was a little, um, it was a little awkward for me because they all came from weekly territories. Ours was a monthly run. And when you're going nationally, you have to do it more on a monthly run deal. So it was harder for me to get my points across uh, to the guys than it would have been with some other people that were used to that. Right. You know? You worked a little bit with Eric Bischoff around this period of time as well. Mm -hmm. Had he changed since his time at AWA at all as far as personality was? Had he changed? <laughs> yeah, he changed. Yeah. I mean, he was a humble, good guy, fun to be around. We used to go hunting together a lot, and uh, but you know he let it go to his head. Um, you know, and that's what happens to a lot of guys that have. I always relate it this way, okay? When people come into wrestling, guys who are athletes are generally really successful in in the sport of wrestling. Guys that weren't are successful, but aren't really successful because they let it go to his head. I mean. Uh, Jesse Ventura is a prime example. Guy couldn't hold his hands up. He could talk good. Everybody had to work around him in the ring to make him look good. It was hard for him to make his opponents look good is, is how you really keep the thing rolling and you get everybody established. He couldn't do that. But if you talk to him, he was the greatest thing that ever hit wrestling. Right. You know? And there was a lot of guys like that. What did you think personally as the Monday Night Wars were going on and as Bischoff was close to putting out WWE out of business? Well, let me tell you, and I should have brought this up with the, before I left Turner Broadcasting and we had Hogan there and everything, I said, here's your deal, man. You got Flair, you got Hogan. Here's what you do. Talk to Vern, buy the rights from him for the AWA, buy the rights for the NWA, which I think they already had. Start the two leagues again, AWA versus NWA. You've got Hogan, AWA champion, Flair NWA champion. You've got your WrestleMania built in every year. I said, you're weak right now in the Midwest and the West. Now you've reestablished the AWA. I can get some guys from New York that wrestled for the AWA, and you got Hogan. You do a card, two matches, AWA, two NWA. Building to your pay-per-views. Eventually you can have crossovers. You can have Flair. He originally started the AWA Jump League. You know, you have. Do you think it was too far gone at that point, the wrestling audience, or do you think? No, I mean, still rem he had me in a room with all the TV people, and this is what I laid out to him, and they told him, and he told me I was nuts; it wouldn't work. Who was saying that? Bischoff. Okay. And then when they fired me, they started the WCW versus the NWO instead of the AWA and NWA, which would have been stronger for him. The only thing I didn't tell him was how to keep it going. That's the secret. There's only a few people in the sport that know how to keep something going. Were you surprised that Eric had the ability to build WCW to such a huge success? Or do you think it was people around him? Well, it was people around him okay. that built it. What he was took it? everybody's ideas. I mean, he was smart that way. It was a typical corporate person, you know? They, they talk to all the underlings, they give them ideas, and then they go, and, oh, here's my idea, you know? Take the bows for it. What was it like dealing with uh, Turner Broadcasting Management? They were tough. They didn't want wrestling on. It was real tough. Uh, you know, Ted loved it. It got him to where he was. It made TBS wrestling did. But nobody in the corporate wanted to admit that and didn't want it, and they didn't want it on. What led you to Have leave? I buried myself enough on this tape yet tonight? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> nobody will ever talk to me again. I've never talked to anybody else. I guess it does make a difference. <laughs> What led you to uh, leaving WCW? Was it the fallout with Eric? No, it was Eric fired me. Okay, that's, yeah. that was the fallout. Okay, yeah. but Hogan was he was an idiot, right? He was just coming in. No, I brought Hogan. I, okay. I was there when Hogan came in, and then when they screwed me on the thing, then I I talked to Jack Kelly, and he told me, and I said, "Well, here's how I know how we can get 
I know how he can get Turner back in Russia on TV. Oh, okay. By signing the Russian. Okay, yeah, yeah. He's, an, he's a superstar in Russia. He's won four gold medals. They will put Turner back on if we make him a star. Okay, I thought, I thought that the whole thing was over. You bringing Hogan in and Eric went to Hogan's behind your back. Well, he, he did do that. That was the second time. The third time then was when, when I did this, and that's when he fired me over that. But prior to that, I had laid out the NWA, the AWA, NWA thing, and you gotcha. know, that would have been the best thing for them to do. They could have captured the market for McMahon right there. They had the two guys. They had Flair and they had Hogan. You just don't have them meet. They pushed them right into each other and throw them in a cage match right away, which I was against. I said, you don't need it. Take Flair, take Hogan, get USA Today, put big pictures of them like they do in boxing, match of the year. You don't need a freaking cage match. Well, do you think that would have been hurt because WWF already did the Hogan-Flair thing? Years? No. Uh-uh. Okay. I didn't think so at all. It was still, you got the two biggest stars. Here they are. And, and, and what is it? I mean, McMahon has told everybody in the world that his wrestling is all a show. It's entertainment. Turner was still on the thing that this is legitimate. Right. So here it is. Here you got. That's the way you sell the package. What are your thoughts on the following uh, guys that you had a little bit of chance to work with? Triple H, Hunter? Fantastic. Unbelievable. I worked with him in Atlanta, and I told them that he was going to be the next big star, and they told me I was crazy. No, he, 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 has, he has a good feel for old school and the new school, which very few guys did. Tom Zink? Flaky. In what aspect? He had all the potential in the world, but he just didn't have his head screwed on right. Scott Norton? Scott had a lot of potential, too. He, he was another one that was hard to deal with. You know, uh, uh, he, he was a big, strong guy. Uh, he should have done a lot better in wrestling than he did. Medusa. She was a great gal. You had a number of matches uh, with a young Ric Flair. What are your memories of Ric Flair? Well, Rick? I was a young Greg Gagne yeah, at the time. Were. I remember that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't an old guy. <laughs> could you even tell in 1973 that he was going to be great? Uh, I could tell I was. I wasn't sure about Rick. <laughs> right. <laughs> No, Rick always had that. Rick, you got to when he came to our camp, he weighed 298 pounds. When he got done, he was 260. So when I wrestled him, he was always at that weight. But uh, we, uh, I think everybody, uh, Ray Stevens, Nick Bockwinkel, Bobby Heenan, uh, everybody that was on the card would come out and watch our match, the two of us. Yeah. And we'd be the, like the first or second match on the card. And... Uh, uh, you know, they were very good coaches. They'd tell us what we did wrong and to slow it down. I mean, we had a pretty good pace going. And, and yeah, he was a natural. He really was. He, he and Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat, are often mentioned in the same breath as, as probably some of the best workers in the ring. Mm -hmm. Who do you think was uh, superior as a worker, Ricky or Rick? Rick. Rick? Okay. Yeah. Why is that? I didn't, I really honestly didn't see Ricky work that much. Uh, Steamboat. Uh, I helped train him, so I want to say he was, but I think, I think Rick's timing, you know, it all comes, to, to me, your classic guys, the guys that were really the best are the ones that had the timing. Right. When to do something, when not to do it. Ricky, when I watched him a few times, was very methodical. A very good, excellent worker, believe me. I'm, I'm not taking it away from but when you're asking me to compare that, I think Flair in his prime, in his prime. Okay. Okay? Yeah. What are your memories of a young Scott Hall? Uh, no different than when he got older. You know, um, we brought him into the AWA. He was struggling, not making it. Um, we pushed him hard, and he had all the tools, but... He knew everything about everything before he, you know. He wouldn't listen. He wouldn't listen. Gotcha. Yeah. Larry Zabisco won the AW uh, belt. Uh, thoughts on his title run and working feud with Larry? Larry who? Larry Zabisco. Yeah, Larry who? Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's, let's see, he's a legend in his own mind. Oh, he was good in the ring. Larry was good in the ring. Memories of Leave uh, it at that. 
you don't like Larry? Oh, I, I, I've never, I've always got along. He, he married my sister. Right. And some things happened there that, no, I don't really care for. I gotcha. We won't get into that. Is Larry. he here this week? I don't believe so, is he? I don't think so. He is here. He is? Oh, oh I did not know that. Oh, good. <laughs> he <laughs> won't see this in time. Yeah. Yeah, he won't see this, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> DDP. DDP, you know, he surprised me. Uh, when I was working for Turner, Eric Bischoff told me to make him a star. And I, and I said, I, here's what I said to him. I said, you've got Steve Austin, you've got Booker T, you have Triple H, you have Kevin Nash, those are your next four stars. And they told me I was crazy and they fired all of them. Hmm. And they told me to make Dallas Diamond Page. I, I thought Diamond looked too old at the time to really get get over with the younger generation. Right. But he, he proved everybody wrong. He was a hard worker, dedicated, and busted his ass to get where he got. Early memories of uh, Paul Heyman. Uh, Paul, he was, I was never a big Paul Heyman fan. Why is that? I don't know. There was just something about him that I didn't trust. You know, he, he looked at you, and it reminded me of the guy that we worked with a, a guy out of India or out of uh, Saudi Arabia one time, and he left. And my dad said, "You know, we knew he was lying to us, and he knew we knew, but he kept lying." And that's what I'd look at when I'd look at Paul Heyman. I would think that. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I hear that a lot. Oh, do you? Oh, yeah. 